on the Talkback Show, on the radio or whatever audiovisual device you choose to use. Welcome to the GBC Podcast, where we talk about the Packers and our hometown of Green Bay. This is episode 60, created on November 8th, 2023. I'm John. I'm in Appleton, Wisconsin. Along with me, Jeff in Minnesota and Neil on the East Coast. Say hello, gentlemen, and tell us what you're drinking. Tonight's beer is a hazy IPA from the Great Notion Brewing Company, the Dead End Hazy IPA. Very Escheresque and also delicious. All right. Being that I was back in Green Bay this last weekend, I was at Costco. And Costco offers the signature Woodson Bourbon Whiskey. Yep, that's right. That is Charles Woodson's Bourbon Whiskey. And it is quite tasty. All right. Pabst Blue Ribbit. That's a man's beer. And also, that's what Jeff and I had at Lenny's Tap on Saturday night. Excellent. Good choice. All right. You can find us on YouTube and Twitter at Green Bay Chat and Facebook at the GBC Podcast, Green Bay Chat. And just the audio is available on Spotify by searching for Green Bay Chat. Well, what are we talking about? Certainly, it was a big home win against the Los Angeles Rams. And the three of us were together. We did a lot of tailgating in Lot 1 and lots of tales of drunkenness and cruelty from the weekend to share with you and we'll take a look ahead of course to week 10 in Pittsburgh and probably even some history between the Packers and the Pittsburgh Steelers but let's start off with the game a win for the Packers in Lambeau Field 20 to 3 the final score we were all there we all saw it (laughs) and we all had a good time right Neil it's always good to be in Lambeau Field it's even better to be in Lambeau Field with friends, going to the game beforehand, tailgating with friends and cousins and my brother. Lambo is always good. It was just a great weekend to be in Green Bay. It was. And so I took my son. He saw a victory at Lambeau. So it's sometimes hard to impress a 16-year-old boy. But I think between the tailgate, the mixture of amusement and bewilderment, perhaps, his comment when he walked into Lambo. As we're going to our seats, he said it's bigger than he thought it would be. That's Uh, what she said. Yeah. (laughs) He was very impressed with the flyover. And overall, I had a blast at at the games. It was great to spend that time with him. And he brought a victory as well. So that was fantastic. Yeah, you don't get a flyover when you put a roof on the stadium, do you? No, <laughs> no. Funny that. He's got a video of it. And like any good 16 year old boy, he's got he took lots of pictures and lots of videos of the yeah. game and things like that. So that was pretty cool. But the flyover, that was awesome to have him record that. And the weather was perfect. Like you said, Jeff, we had a great time tailgating a little bit of rain here and there throughout the game, but it didn't come down too hard didn't affect the game. As we said, the Packers come away with a victory. But overall, Neil wants to tell us about all the great statistics of this game. Most importantly, Neil, not only do we score a touchdown in the first half, but we get first downs on the opening drive. My goodness, how did this team start off like they were fired out of a cannon? Yeah, I was with my brother and and my cousin, and we were definitely doing move those chains in section 103. And we had good participation for move those chains, move those chains, move those chains. Huh in section 103 it didn't start out perfect the rams got the ball first and they converted on their first third down attempt of the game but we started to get a sense of where this game was going on the rams first drive because the second time they had a third down opportunity it was a third and one jair tackles for a loss of two and we get the ball back after a very short rams drive and yes as john said the most exciting part to get this game going was first of all that the rams did not drive a long way on their first drive and second of all we got two first downs on the packers first drive and that was just a great thing to see a pass from love to dontavian wicks a run by aj dillon Two first downs on the first drive in the first quarter. We're advancing the ball in the first quarter. How is that even possible? From where I was sitting, Neil, I could see you. And so after every first (laughs) down, I would look over to my right, and I knew exactly where you were. You and a bunch of people would stand up. I couldn't hear you, (laughs) which was was kind of weird, right? Because you're far enough away with four sections over. And to watch, Will and I would just kind of watch this and like, okay, first down. That That's fantastic. The great thing in Lambeau Field, I mean, Bill Jarts, the PA announcer, does a good job getting the, the crowd fired up and we celebrate first down. I'm pretty sure I heard a good chuckle in the crowd when that first first down 
came about that we were like, oh gosh, we're getting to say first down here in the first drive and people had fun with it. And the second one, then we were like really steamrolling. But as far as momentum in this game goes, I'll tell you, honestly, I felt it in that drive and I just didn't think that we were going to lose it after that. I just said, this is just unreal how they're starting off. This is the way this team should be looking. Rams just were not into it. They had a backup quarterback on the day. I felt optimistic from that, probably from the second first down on through the rest of the game. Of course, we didn't make it on our third, third down attempt. We failed at that. And that was a third and one. And Aaron Jones went zero yards. And then we actually went for it on fourth down deep in our own territory. Line up. We do the Philadelphia tush push except we have problems lining up on the push-tush, as it were. Offensive offsides? Everybody was like, what the hell is that? What's going on? There was this sense of, like, frustration and bewilderment. How so did they did, screw this up? Yeah, I did listen to the post game on the drive home, and the word that came out on that is, apparently, in their scouting of the Packers, the Los Angeles Rams picked a little nuance in the rule book, in the way the offensive line has to line up, and where the helmets have to be like in relation to the center. So you have your center out here and then you have to be like on the Come shoulder on. pad and so on off of that. And that those guards were, you know, their head, they their head was a tape measure? I mean, yeah. come on. Well, I, but, but, I, but I've seen, but, I, but I've seen the video. I mean, Runyon right. was clearly off. You look at the still shot. Runyon was clearly offside. His head was basically where the center's head was. I yeah. can't see how they wouldn't call it in a situation like that. I'd be shocked that that wouldn't be called every time. And, but the thing is, is both calls came from the Ram side of the field that, the, the allegation is that the Rams coaches were in the side judge's ear saying, look, that that's an illegal formation or that that's an offsides formation. And that's what it came down to. And I think that they must have corrected it throughout the game somehow because those calls came in the first half. Well, I would hope that there wouldn't have been a second one, unfortunately, but, but there was, there was, there was. <laughs> yeah, fool me once, shame on me, et cetera, that, but yeah. Oh, that was that was just I mean, it was it was a risky place to go for a fourth and one. And it was great that we made it until, well, we didn't. Now, Neil, However, the Rams bailed us out then on the next series. I, it was both teams, I think, demonstrating that they're not great teams on the next series. Right. They fumbled, but that gets overturned by a uh, Rashawn Gary face mask. Uh, Rashawn Gary offsides as well. Back and, then to we back get bailed out, and then we get bailed out by Jonathan Owens with a sack and a fumble to co recovered by Devondre Campbell. And I, I, at some level, this was almost a comedy of errors, but I'm glad that our team was the one that made the plays at the end of that. No, agreed. There was a guy a little bit later in the game, made a comment about how sloppy the game seemed or whatever. And the guy turns around, he's like, these are two and five teams. The Packers definitely seem to want it more. They were more fired up and, and less prone for mistakes. They yeah, this is a more. this is a home game that yeah. they knew they could not lose and then end up going two and six to essentially the halfway point of the season. But it is true still, nonetheless, that those two Rashawn Gary penalties, essentially, although they were 20 yards total in penalties, ended up costing us 36 yards of position. And again, thankfully, we made the plays further on or alternatively, thankfully, the Rams were sufficiently inept that that didn't hurt us like it would hurt us with a good team. We're still making those early penalties in the first half and it just didn't bite us in the ass this time i wasn't dissuade either in my feel of how the momentum went in the end the gary face mask was kind of right in front of me where i was in the south end zone and you could tell that gary was kind of frustrated with himself it was a little bit sloppy it was certainly an unintentional swipe of the face mask but it was enough to get the flag he was definitely upset with himself but it was just one of those things where it wasn't sloppy intentional play it was just not good. He certainly fixed it the rest of the game after that. Still the Packers in the first quarter are going to Packers in the first quarter. So the first quarter was sloppy, but no points were scored. So we weren't down by anything. We had some first downs, but then the Packers start putting together a pretty decent drive. And it was not only a first drive that was beyond the first quarter. Most of the plays were actually in the first quarter. And it was very encouraging to see a number of a pass to Guara, a run to Jones, a long run for Dylan, another run for Jones, another run for Jones, keep moving the ball down the field. And then on a third and three, Aaron Jones gets another five yard gain. Aaron Jones scores a touchdown. That was a lot of running, uh, both by Jones and by Dylan, as well as passing to both of our running backs. That was a good, complete sort of drive. And although that drive ended with a touchdown early in the second quarter, most of that drive was in the first quarter. And to your point, Jeff, 
in the first quarter, although it was 0-0 in score, we outgained Los Angeles 66 yards to 20 in the first quarter. That's a victory over anything else we've done recently. Well, and not only that, but we've been wishing this for <laughs> pretty much the whole season. Give the damn ball to Aaron Jones. Get him involved in the game. Even if he has a couple, maybe short runs or whatever, he is going to work his ass off. And overall, this worked. Feed him the damn ball. He was effective. And what was cool about the first play of the second quarter, because they switched sides, yeah, they ran in the north end zone where we were. So we'll get a good video of that as well. So, so that was pretty cool. First touchdown coming right at us. And then after that drive, it's continued to look good as far as the Packers are concerned. We get the Rams immediately on the next drive out on a three and out. We get the ball back on our own 38. This was another situation where we moved the ball, but and then we were sort of in no man's land again. Then we line up. It was deja vu all over again. With just the goofy penalties, four plays, we turn the ball over again on downs. Both teams made some curious plays as far as getting into that edge of field goal range that definitely is a makeable field goal for these kickers that have these strong legs nowadays. But yeah, getting down to the Rams 38 is just a frustrating place to be. And you know, we ended up taking a delay on the end of that drive to move out. And I just, I, I don't understand necessarily doing the delay at that point you might as well go for it at that distance I mean it wasn't a it was fourth and seven but it was just it's a, just just a frustrating place to be when you could try to kick the field and I understood why they did it and they certainly got the Rams back for their next drive they started their next drive on their own 10 yard line so it worked but on the other hand Whelan does not have a great track record this year as far as getting the ball inside the 20 without it being a touchback and again it worked this game and maybe that was part of it is we've got to get him some reps to make sure that this becomes a consistent part of our special teams it was just a back and forth a bunch of three and out no it's no just... we had we, we had a four and out after their three and what? out we had the four and out because we had the other second Rashawn Gary offsides and the Packers three and out that became a four and out was even more frustrating because we made it essentially to midfield once again, Jordan Love makes it with the tush push and, or the love tap, as we're going to call it, and yes. get that second penalty. But, I mean, we had good field position on three of our five drives in the first half. And to only have a single touchdown when we start out in great field position on most of our drives in the first half was a little bit frustrating. Well, and that's, again, the penalties and just, like I said, it was it was just sloppy. But fortunately... The Rams were were matching us slap for slap or whatever you want to call it. And that's sort of what bailed us out until the Rams put together a pretty good drive. Yeah, a 13 play drive. It's that long drive thing that's uh, been a signature of our defense this year. And perhaps even more frustratingly, again, they started from their own 10 yard line and made it all the way down into Packers territory before having the 52 yard field goal that ended up making it a four point game. They had also three third down conversions on that field goal drive. Keeping in mind, this is their only scoring drive in the game. Of course, we didn't know that at the time, but on their only scoring drive of the game, they had a third and four they converted, a third and 11 they converted with a long pass to Cooper Cup and a third and three pass that they converted as well. It wasn't really looking great. I mean, it was looking like two bad teams that either one could fail at any time. I was not as optimistic as John was at this point. And <laughs> especially when they moved the ball down, starting from such poor field position, you know, we had already shown ineptness on our offense several times. It was certainly not merely a first quarter problem. And to have that long drive with their backup quarterback and move the ball the way they did was not making me feel good inside sort of now we get to under two minutes so they kick the field goal okay it's seven three this weird thing happens then so it's not the beginning of the third quarter it's still the second quarter so you know everybody's kind of wondering okay this is love's chance for a two-minute drive and guess what he put together a pretty solid two-minute drive yeah we got the ball back with a minute 42 and 10 plays marched down the field including a third and 17 conversion to Dobbs that ended up being a first down. Another first down pass to Dobbs of nine yards, a Jordan Love eight yard run for a first down. We were making real conversions. And in the end, the thing that hurt us the most was two things. One, we had a sack that moved us a little further away from field goal range. 
and then a offsides penalty on Jaden Reed that may have been the difference between us getting three points at the end of the first half and not getting three points at the end of the first half. From where I was sitting, I couldn't tell, certainly long enough, but missing that field goal to go into halftime, that was a, a bit deflating. They put together this drive, they did what they needed to do, and just unfortunately couldn't close it out. Yeah, but overall, that second quarter was once again one in which all the numbers point in the Packers' direction. So we won by 0. .7 to 3 in the second quarter. We won on first downs 7 to 3 in the second quarter. We won on yards 85 to 71 in that second quarter. The numbers were not dominant by any stretch of the imagination, but they were still certainly pointing in our direction. Which, thank God, it's not the most fantastic quarter of football. But based on what's gone on the past month plus, it was a hell of a lot better than what we had seen. It's really nice to be ahead at halftime. I mean, it's nice <laughs> to be ahead at halftime. Or the whole game. Yes. Uh, what a concept, right? <laughs> well, and that's like I said, even at half, I did not feel like this team was out of it. I didn't feel any change in the momentum, even with as dismal as the third quarter starts out. Frustrating, but still a team that they looked like they had their head on their shoulders for once this season. And I don't know if this was a coaching thing or if Lafleur was like, okay, I want to try and out coach to my protege, Sean McVay or something. I don't know. But this was, again, one of these things where I don't know if it was because I was there in person but it just seemed like they were, they being the players and even the coaches were prepared, right? Because like you said, John, yay asshats to open up the third quarter. I mean, a 51 yard return. Positive yards for the assets, positive well, yards. Right, exactly. You know, everybody's fired up, huge kickoff return, 51 yards. They start in, in Rams territory. And then something really weird happens. That was the <laughs> strangest, because everybody around me was like, ground can't cause a fumble. Well, apparently it can. But it, it can if the player is not down by contact. Very frustrating to start out the second half so well and then immediately lose that momentum with the yeah. Wicks fumble. But okay, so we weren't going to dominate the third quarter maybe like we have in a number of games this season. But we at least had the Rams on their back foot a little bit before they got the ball. And that's when it started raining. Like, oh, come on. Really? We don't need it to rain anymore. But the defense here stepped up. Sort of. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we got lucky at a, at a basic level on that drive as well. The Rams, again, starting out close to midfield, got all the way down to the Green Bay 29 and had three plays of between 7 and 15 yards. But McDuffie, obviously, with a big play, they had an offensive pass interference that sort of shot themselves in the foot, moved them back to a third and 25. And essentially, when those negative plays happened, both, again, by a five-yard five tackle for loss by McDuffie, the offensive pass interference, they were far enough back that it became a problem. They made it to the Packers 36. And this is a very curious situation. Their field goal kicker had made a 52-yard field goal in the first half. This would have been a 53-yard field goal and they chose to punt from the Green Bay 36? That was super weird. But again, okay, we'll take it. I was thinking the same thing. Like, why don't they kick the field goal here? Because, or attempt, because he certainly had the leg. The, the wind wasn't really an issue. I don't know. They didn't. Who cares? Move on. <laughs> yeah, mo move on. But let's shoot ourselves in the foot one more time. Because the next drive, start from our own 16, ends up with a great Aaron Jones run that, ended up not with a great result with an Aaron Jones fumble. So we had fumbles on two consecutive drives. Once again, gave the Rams great field position. And once again, the Rams kind of didn't execute. So yeah, I mean, it was awful. We we're deep in Packers territory. Jones pops it up, right? I don't know if he was just trying to join the crowd, you know, like, hey, everybody fumble today or I don't know, whatever. But again, the defense, to their credit here, Rather than just, you know, saying, ole, you know, we've seen this play out where the offense of the opposite team just like jams it down our throat at this point. The defense did not allow that to happen, forcing a field goal deep in our territory. And once to McDuffie being key, they had a third and two. He has a three yard tackle for loss. So two consecutive drives with big plays by McDuffie. Because yardage was lost, they decided, okay, again, at this point, it's seven, three kick the field goal, see what happens. Nice when the other team's asshats screw up instead of yeah. just our asshats. Exactly. So they miss a field goal. This is precisely where the guy in front of me was like, yeah, these are two two-win teams, right? I mean, because it was just, 
it was this comedy of errors, a couple fumbles, missed field goals. Can't take advantage of errors by the other team. Just right. Raining. It's a little slippery outside. However, this is where things changed. There really was like a shift here. Yeah. I mean, our next drive, we pulled some plays together. So it ended up being a drive that started because of the missed field goal on our 39. So decent field position. We moved the ball 53 yards in seven plays with some big passing plays, 18 yards to Wicks, six yards to Musgrave, 25 yards to Musgrave, uh, a couple of good runs. We got all the way down to the Rams four yard line. And unfortunately took a sack on their four yard line, ended up having to kick a field goal, but it was a pretty decent sustained drive with a number of first downs. It would have been nice to get down to their four and actually score a touchdown, but this allowed us at least to make it a seven point game rather than a four point game. And this is where, like I said, there seemed to be like this real actual momentum shift. Both offensive defense at this point seemed to kind of take control. Having the seven point lead made a big difference. 10 3 versus 7 3 is a big difference. So you felt hope and, but not despair. The big thing on the day is that there weren't a lot of fire Joe Barry chants on this, surprisingly. The defense played well, maybe because they had a lesser competition on the offensive side. You're dealing with a, a young, well, not really young, but a basically a backup quarterback. A backup um, quarterback who's since been released. Yeah, who's yeah. no longer with it, the it, team. It's, it's, the, it's <laughs> the Packers defense that caused a quarterback to become released. <laughs> yeah, we'll take that. Right. Because of that, you know, your defense looks good because they're playing up against things that uh, a team that isn't that great. So you're right, Jeff, about that momentum. Things feel like everything is going Green Bay's way. Even though, like you said, at the time, the score now is 10-3, to 3, this is where, fortunately, both offense and defense – now are looking for, or I don't know if it's blood in the water or whatever, seem to want or sense a sense of success. Or or possibly it was just confidence, right? They realized, okay, we can win this game. We're going to try to win this game. And we talked back in the Saints game about how belief becomes something that is a useful thing moving forward. And there seemed to be enough belief after those first three quarters that we're going to get the job done in the fourth quarter. And at a basic level, the Rams made one last big push for it on the last drive of the third quarter that went over into the fourth quarter. They had seven plays, and they had a huge conversion on a third and eight with a pass to Nakua for 18 yards. Incidentally, that was the last third down conversion of the Rams in the entire game. They get down to Packers territory. It's the end of the third quarter, and they've got a fourth and two. And they decide that they're going to go for it on fourth and two to start the fourth quarter. And that's, again, where our defense stood up. Which was fantastic. Everybody's into it because this is really where the turning point of the game happened, I think. Certainly stopping their momentum was a big deal. Not that it actually helped us on the next drive, but going into our discussion of the team, this has been a very much third quarter team. We were somewhat better than the Rams in the third quarter. We outscored them 3 nothing. We had one more first down. We got more yards, 94 to 65, but it wasn't like a dominant performance that we've had in some of the games in the third quarter, but sometimes you don't need dominant. Sometimes you need just good enough. And that third quarter was good enough for the Packers. Whereas the offense had been dominating mostly in the third quarter, at least as of late, it was sort of the defense, you know, they did not give up any huge drives. They didn't give up any touchdowns, obviously, or well, frankly, any points at all, but Nonetheless, this is where, again, sometimes the defense has sort of gotten back on their heels and let the other team back in. That did not happen here. Sort of an inferior product, but it still didn't happen. Of course, the Packers didn't then go turn around and immediately (laughs) shove the ball down the Rams' throats. They go with a quick three and out, loss of six yards and a sack. The Rams get the ball back, but now the defense starts to really make some big plays. And my favorite play of the game actually was on that next drive. And it was nice to see Jair Alexander really defending passes, not getting smoked. And again, the receivers for the Rams are good. Maybe the quarterback, you know, this was not Matt Stafford back there, obviously. But to see Alexander defensing passes, probably the play of the game, and certainly where the momentum really, really shifted is Jair going back and tipping that ball. And then... 
Johnson catching it for the interception. I've watched that, rewatched that several times. It's <laughs> this is the defense that we wanted to have all year. And maybe it wasn't the exact players that we thought were going to make these plays, but I don't care what Jair was Jair. Our D backs were making plays. Our defense was making plays. That is what really felt like the turning point of the game as far as I was concerned, because it was still a one score game yep. at that point. We get the ball back. And we actually didn't move it that far, unfortunately, kind of like taping, taking control of the game. And we do at least get some points. Yeah, and we had an important love to Wicks pass. We had a long run by Dylan, a couple of other long runs. We got the ball far enough. I mean, when you start get the ball at midfield, you don't have to go that far, right? A 34-yard field goal does not require you to get that many yards. And they ended up getting 34 yards on that drive and again when you get the ball at midfield when your defense is making the plays that give you good field position you take advantage of it and maybe in the first half we didn't take advantage of our field position every time we absolutely took advantage of the field position in the fourth quarter field goal and now it is a two score game and the way that rams offense was playing the way our defense was playing that felt like we were in position for the win over four minutes off the clock as well and they were having success running the ball and so kind of one of these more ball control to keep their defense off the damn field to give them a bit of a break here as well which again has not been happening they didn't move the ball that far they got a score and they took a, some time off the clock and then the rams get the ball back and their defense now is gassed and they didn't get a break from their offense packers defense well rested forces a very quick three and out that only took 40 seconds off the clock in completion on third down. This is now feeling very good when the Packers get the ball back so quickly after having had some longer drives to the Rams earlier in the game. It's like, no, we are taking control of this game. And so we finally see all pieces of the offense clicking here. Finally, this is how we sort of envision this. Even though Love is a young quarterback, the receivers, everybody was was executing well and making the plays. I told you guys, I, I enjoyed the game all the way through. And, and yeah, it's a watching the clock right now. Even like you said, Jeff, we got the field goal, but we took four minutes off the clock. We're watching the clock and we're thinking 10 points, this is plenty. But Neil, I want to hear the scoring drive. And I really want the final numbers on Jordan Love because I think this was a spectacular day for this team that needed a win. They needed a win, and when they had the opportunity for the killer drive, they made the killer drive. They got the ball back with 8.26 left in the game and had a methodical eight-play, 72-yard drive that included a 10-yard pass to Dobbs. It included third down conversions. It included a huge 37-yard pass to Christian Watson, who desperately needed that sort of play to get himself back into the Packers playbook, something where we have to make other teams take notice. I think that was really important for Christian Watson confidence. And then the best offensive play of the game when uh, I, I think I could feel Jeff's erection from, from two back, sections man. over is a <laughs> touchdown pass to Luke Musgrave, tight end, First of all, Jordan loves, shakes the, the defense off in both directions, throws it right to Musgrave in the middle, and then Musgrave makes a move right down the seam, scores the touchdown. And uh, I, I just, Jeff, your happiness is uh, well, it, it was, it was, it was definitely away. a dagger is what you're saying, Neil. <laughs> and that's the play that I've been like asking for, for like right. most of the year, right? Get the tight end down the middle. Right. Right, because when he caught the ball initially, there wasn't anybody within five yards of him. He was, like, wide open, and he turned around, and, yeah, he made the defender miss. Okay, that's what a high draft pick is supposed to do because he's fast. And it was awesome because it was, again, it was coming in our end zone. It was pretty awesome. But you talk about that that killer play, Neil, that dagger there. Over the last 30 years, we've, we've enjoyed great success with this team, but how many times over that 30 years has that that killer instinct not been there? That that late game conservatism of, hey, we've got a lead, we got, we're gonna just hold on to this, and we're gonna play this game out, versus let's score a point and just get the hell out of here. That's what I think fans have been wanting for the longest time. Get that, even you know, no matter how close the game is, let's get one more score, let's just drive it home and let's leave on a high note instead of this, you know, to to end the game. And the crowd got it that day. Yeah. And you could tell that the crowd appreciated the way this team played through the end of the game. But by only getting 20 points. Only. <laughs> well, no. So, you know, 
They got 20 points. They didn't get 21 points. But you know what that means? Then you can't go to your local festival foods in Wisconsin. (laughs) (laughs) And when you buy a case of Miller Lite, you don't get a free 12 pack. You are worried about your free 12 pack, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> Jeff, I was Jeff, I was not concerned about that element, but <laughs> certainly Lambeau Field was rocking after the Musgrave touchdown. And I think the rest of the game was fundamentally gravy. The Rams had one more short drive. You know, we stopped them after 27 yards. We get the ball back with 232 left in the game, have a key conversion of uh love with a two-yard run on fourth one, this time without an offside on our offensive Yay! line. A couple of big runs by Emmanuel Wilson, including a 31 yarder. And then we get to go to the victory formation, the best play in football. And yes, indeed. we leave with a victory and John going to the statistical elements. I'm going to first talk about the fourth quarter. The fourth All quarter right. was our dominant quarter in this game. First downs. We beat them seven to one in the fourth quarter yards, 146 to 31 in the fourth Ooh. quarter passing yards, 74 to 31 rushing yards 72 rushing yards to zero in the fourth quarter for the Packers overall in the game 184 rushing yards combined with 207 net passing yards you talk about needing to get a running game involved well yeah we got a running game involved in that game and finally as far as time of possession in the fourth quarter 1253 to 207 for possession in the fourth quarter that was a dominant way to end the game that's how you're going to leave the hometown crowd happy. And we were indeed happy. Once again, the most important stat of the game is points. Jeff, yeah, okay, only 20 points, but a 20 to 3 win. <laughs> but what about the the player numbers, Neil? Tell us how Jordan Love did cuz you know, we're on the Love train, right? We are on the Love train. Join in and Jordan Love, 20 of 26, 228 yards, 8.8 yards per attempt, one touchdown, zero interceptions. There were four sacks in the game. That might be something a little concerning going in, but mostly they were relatively non-consequential. But let's look at the Jordan Love stats in the second half of the game. He was 12 of 13 for 160 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions, a 143.6 passer rating in the second half. And that one incompletion in the second half was a ball that he threw away. Essentially, every time he tried to make a completion in the second half, we had a completion in the second half. That is your young quarterback stepping up. And making progress. This was one of his better games, at least in terms of completion percentage. No turnovers. You know, for him, I mean, he didn't have a ton of yards, but you know what? I'll take the good completion percentage. And Aaron Jones, 20 carries, right? And we've been saying we need someone to put up a 100-yard day. And all we needed was one pin, Rodney, and he just came short. One yard, 99 yards for Aaron Jones, correct? 20 runs for only 73 yards, actually. It seemed like it was more efficient than that. But overall, our running game, excluding the kneel downs, 36 rushes for 187 yards, a 5.2 average. If you include just our running backs, 33 runs for our running backs for 156 yards, a 4.7 yard per attempt average for our running backs. That is what we wanted to see as far as our running backs helping our passing game out. Beautiful game as far as the balance was concerned. We still haven't had a 100-yard receiver. Okay, fine. However, the receivers, they're catching more balls, or they caught more balls in this game as well. Luke Musgrave led with 51 yards, three receptions. But again, as we talked about last week, a huge number of targets, but not not a big number of catches. This time, the number of targets and the number of actual receptions, they were pretty close. Tight ends catching more balls is exactly what we needed. And our wide receivers caught more balls too. So yes, we still, our top receiver in yards was Wicks at 49. Our wide receivers overall were only 11 receptions for 141 yards, but that's still progress. And I, I like to see the movement forward. In general, our receivers did well as far as their targets matching their number of receptions fairly closely the team is moving in the right direction on offense and they're moving in the right direction on defense too. And Neil, also some big plays on the defense all the way around. I think the one stat line that I like, Jonathan Owens showing up on the game, eight total tackles. He gets a sack. He gets the forced fumble, really showing his presence on the field and being a force in the, in the defensive secondary. Yeah. And the defensive secondary made plays all the way around. And the number that really stood out was Carrington Valentine. He was thrown at seven times in the game, 
zero receptions and balls thrown mm -hmm. at Carrington Valentine. We had Anthony Johnson making stepping up after the trade of Rasul Douglas. He made that interception, but overall our D backs looked good again against good Los Angeles wide receivers. And then there was a Lucas Van Ness sighting. Too. Yeah. And he had a tackle for loss and a, and a quarterback hit. And just finishing with the number of plays that our, that our defenders made, we had 10 passes defended. You expect things from Jair and Valentine, but a pass def and, and Johnson, but a pass defense by Smith and two passes defended by KGB Carl Brooks. <laughs> Everyone's making contributions on the defense. That's why the game ended with the Rams only having 187 total yards to the 391 for the Packers. The main thing is we have to hope that a lot of this good play, both offensive and defensive, carries over into Pittsburgh. We'll talk about the Pittsburgh matchup in a moment. But first, the important stuff. <laughs> we were all in Green Bay, not only just, you know, there for the game, but you two got there early. I can give you guys great credit. You got there when the party started shortly after 8 a.m. Jeff, you got a good parking spot. We were right by lot one. You got to see the setup. You got to see. People just kind of start to filter in how that crowd grows throughout the morning. It was amazing having fortunately not been there to, to see this. And like I said, to have my son there, sort of, I told him it's sort of like a crazy Halloween party. <laughs> it's just people dressed up. This is not just face paint maybe or, a, you know, and a t-shirt. This is like serious, serious stuff here. Now, you know, the, the Shotsky, I thoroughly enjoyed meeting a lot of the lot one folks. That was fantastic. Talk with Chris and of course, Scott and with all, everything that's going on. And just over the course of, of the morning, just to watch the crowd swell and, and all the, the craziness that is associated with lot one and everything that goes on, the skits. Oh my God. I did yeah. not know that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I've shared that with you once or twice, Jeff. That yes, I, you know what? But in person, right? I mean, because you're like, it's okay, different. Okay. Yes, it's different. Okay, in here's person, here's yeah. the old Tim coming up, coming up, and I'm right. like, okay. You had no idea what it was going to be, right? So Scott, no idea, Scott, right? And and usually uh, Justin is the person who's up there. Justin uh, did not make it this weekend. Chris helped out, but it's it's a routine called Tim the diehard Packer fan, and the comedian's name is Paul Gilmartin, and he had created this routine at least 20 years ago maybe more uh the first time i ever heard it was on the bob and tom show and scott ended up taking that routine and we play it and they pantomime it basically so yeah. you hear paul gilmartin doing the routine with scott and whoever's up on the tailgate with him doing you know lip syncing and playing out the tim the diehard packer fan and then it goes into the wedge of allegiance written by a fellow who goes by Fulio. He is a member of the Cheeseheads with Attitude. You may remember their hit, Where the Hell is Nina? But the Cheeseheads with Attitude, these guys hang out at the Lot 1 party. They're there once in a while as well. You got to see a good cross-section of this group that they call the Die Hard Packer fans. And then sort of for a bonus, the Dick in a Box. The dick in a Box is always a bonus, <laughs> yes. So the Dick in a Box routine from Saturday Night Live, uh, Justin Timberlake, um, the vocals there, and again, Scott and whoever joins them up on the tailgate, they have the box, they have everything going. That leads to kind of a fun point about the the trivia. You know that I wore that lanyard, right? And and Scott and the people of the party, we we Scott made these lanyards for us with the little VIP and our picture on them, which is nice. You know, it just kind of okay. says, hey, we're the bartenders or we're the people that are kind of running the party. If you need something, talk to us. Did you know? That we have, you know, just like Jerry Glanville used to set aside tickets for Elvis Presley, we have a lanyard. We have a VIP pass made for, would you believe, Justin Timberlake. And if he ever shows up, we are ready to put it on him. He has, it's all made, prepared, ready to go. So Justin Timberlake is an honorary member of the Lot 1 tailgate well, party. And he is a Packer fan, is he, he is. not? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, so make Harry it happen, Lot 1, yeah. folks. Come on. <laughs> Get Timberlake yeah, so like there, right? Yeah, and you I notice mean... I played I played a couple of JT songs as well. Yep. Harry Styles will get played once in a while because Harry likes the Packers as well. Yeah. Uh, but I've been told that I have to start upping my Taylor Swift playlist. Neil, I'm going to have to rely on you to get me some <laughs> uh, tailgate party-worthy songs from Taylor Swift for 
uh, the game on December 3rd. I'm happy to help you in that regard. I just want to echo Jeff's sentiments. Yes, Jeff and I showed up. The tailgate starts at 8 o'clock, and I think Jeff and I were there at 8.15. So we were able to, there to experience the vast majority of the tailgate. We were in Lot 1 for basically the entire time. That's actually my first time I've been in Lot 1 the entire time without going to other events, and the time just absolutely flew by. I was just like, how is how are we already at game time and we have to go inside? It seems like we just started the tailgate. Now I may have done a couple yeah. too many shot skis <laughs> over that time period as well, because I, I had a few, few too many people I knew who wanted to do shot skis with me. I went to further down in that same row and, and met a, a friend of ours, Jill, who also wanted to do a different shot ski with me, but yeah, it, it, it was just a great day. And I will note that Jeff and I did this after staying out until one in the morning the night before. <laughs> we had a good experience going to various bars in Green Bay on Saturday night before the game. We got into town Saturday with Will and, and staying at my mom's place. And so we, we had a little dinner and Neil and I decided to go out on the town. So I picked up Neil. I was his chauffeur, his chariot. First stopping at Neil's house and, and with his parents and regaling them for a little bit, having a nice chat with them. Always good to see Neil's parents. So then we start out at the Lorelei, and Dave was the bartending. So it was a Saturday night. He's not always there Saturday night. So we saw Dave had a fantastic Guinness. Neil, do you recall what you had? It was one crap beer. I mean, one thing that that the Lorelei and one of our usual hangouts in Packers Weekend or whenever we're in Green Bay is that they've got a selection of classic beers such as Guinness to German bar. They have a number of classic German beers, but they're also really good about local craft beers. They typically have about 15-ish beers on tap and say eight or nine of them are local craft beers. So I was just enjoying the local craft beers as Dave is known for. So then from the Lorelei, we decide to go to Badger State Brewing. So my preference for beers is, as you well know, is a stout. So I'm thinking, you know what? I'm guessing Badger State has a stout. And sure enough, it was a double dubious. And they were very tasty. So Neil and I <laughs> solved the problems of the world at, uh, at Badger State Brewing. Perfect. And we had a number of rounds there as well. Kind of watching. It wasn't packed, but it wasn't empty. Uh, there was a couple Rams fans there as well. Uh, Neil, you specifically went over and chatted with them. One of the things we've talked about talking to visiting fans is one of my favorite things about game weekends. And there were not many Rams fans there overall in the weekend, but there was a pair that was hanging out. And so I went over and chatted with them. I told them about the lot one tailgate. I, I invoked my best John is trying to promote the lot one <laughs> tailgate. And indeed they showed up and did a shot ski with me at the lot one tailgate the next day. Nice. Well done. So after a number of rounds of craft beer at Badger State Brewing, we decide, okay, where are we going to go from here? On the way there, we had driven past a, uh, well, an interesting looking bar that we had driven past numerous times before, a lair called Brewskies. It's a place on Broadway. They've got a 38 jersey is sort of their logo with a uh, well-endowed woman doing the promotion on the sign. And I've driven by it so many times and it's like, wow, it's, it looks like a classic dive bar. It looks like a place we have to go. I mean, it was, it was a perfectly fine dive bar. We yep. had a beverage there. I've now added brewskis to the list of Green Bay dive bars I've been to. John, you and I can return there as well. Okay. Indeed. So we stopped at Brewski's. We, uh, it was not super busy there. So we sat at the bar. We chatted with the bartender for a few minutes. Uh, we had a uh, obligatory beverage there. And then Neil kind of out of the blues, like, let's go to Lenny's. And I'm like, <laughs> like I knew where it was, right? I'm like, <laughs> okay. So I'm like, okay, where's Lenny's? Well, it's down Broadway. Okay. We hop in the car. We go north on Broadway and we get to Lenny's. And honestly, I really liked Lenny's. It was a really cool bar. It was, cool bar, great layout, really yeah. interesting people there that were you know, the bartender, everyone who was there. I it was has been ranked as one, and people have told us that it's one of the best dive bars in Green Bay. I had never been there until that Saturday, and absolutely, I think that Lenny's is a place to return to many times in the future. So you went there after the Arsenal match, right? I mean, is that, so you were there twice in like 12 hours. <laughs> so, there, so there's a reason why I recommended going back there at night, Jeff. Indeed, indeed. So as we're leaving, so like it's this big wooden door 
right, to get out on to, in, in, onto Broadway. And so I kind of expecting when you leave, you just kind of push the door open, right? Yeah, not so much. Not this door. There's like a latch <laughs> that I didn't see. And, and like, so I'm pushing on the door. I'm like, it's not opening. So finally, I'm like feeling around on the door. And then finally, I, I hit the like the little latch. And then it opens. And there's three people outside. And they're looking at us like, and I'm like, <laughs> their latch was stuck. And just, <laughs> Midvale yeah. School for the Gifted, Jeff. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So most important thing, I got Neil home safe and sound. Okay. And so the next morning, though, was a little, you know, that that PBR craft beer <laughs> thing. Well, well, yeah, not sorry, so well, much. yeah, mixing high alcohol and indeterminate alcohol beers, craft beers <laughs> with, with cheaper beers is just not a good combination to go with. It, there needs to be some sort of equivalent of uh, beer than liquor, never sicker associated with mixing craft beer and cheap beer, you know, something along the lines of with them shit, you won't be fit. Yeah. It, it's, it was a, just a whole bunch of different alcohol by volume. You drink the craft beers and your brain is thinking, oh, this is just like the PBR. And uh, no, it just decidedly not. And I was particularly happy that we had the extra hour due to the end of daylight savings time <laughs> that put me in a little bit better position for tailgating on Sunday morning. Agreed. Yeah. Imperial Stout, then PBR. Not, not great. Not great. And Neil, you mentioned we enjoy the visiting fans coming into tailgate. We try to show everybody a good time in lot one. Packer fans also like to tailgate when they're on the road. And there is one team that I can tell you, they show up really well in Green Bay and they like Packer fans. They call themselves the Yinzer mob. And Neil, you're going to get to see them. You're going to Pittsburgh on Sunday for the Packers Steelers matchup. I wish you well. I'm looking forward to it. I have never been to Heinz Field or whatever it's called now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Pittsburgh is a, is a short enough drive heading there Saturday afternoon. Going to hang out with, with the Packers traveling crowd as well as the Steelers fans on Saturday night and then plan to be up early and spend a whole morning tailgating before the Packers-Steelers game and hopefully see the Packers perform in Pittsburgh. Although with the Packers performing in Pittsburgh, the history is not very good as far as that's concerned. The last time the Packers won in Pittsburgh, all of us were age zero. 1970 was the last time. <laughs> Jeff the was almost No, won. I think it was almost one. Yeah. Almost. I think it was December 6th. Yeah. No, it okay. would have been one. Yeah. So, so we, we, we were all... <laughs> extremely young lads in that last Packers victory in Pittsburgh. Interesting element about that last Packers victory in Pittsburgh. That was Bart Starr as the starting quarterback. It was his last win as a Packers starting quarterback. Uh, 14 of 32, 235 yards, two touchdowns. We'll ignore the other part. Pittsburgh had two quarterbacks. It overall went eight for 34 in the game. The big name is Terry Bradshaw yeah. showed up later in the game. Terry Bradshaw was three for 20 with 110 <laughs> yards in that game. One touchdown, four interceptions. Three. The, 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 you the think you're going to, you think you're going to have growing pains with your young quarterback. Those are growing pains for a young quarterback. How does a guy go three for 20? He throws one touchdown pass for 87 yards. So he gets, you know, the other two completions for a total of 23 yards and then doesn't complete it. And then he said, yeah, he threw four. Uh, he, there threw, he, threw more, he, threw, he threw more to the Packers than he threw yeah. to his own team for completions. For the Packers defense, a total of five interceptions on the game. Willie Wood had a pick, Bob Jeter, Fred Carr, and Ken Ellis had two interceptions on that game. And you're right, more passes completed to the Packers than to Steelers receivers. There's some other... Interesting historical elements for both teams heading to this into this game. One thing that uh, I would say is surprising about the Steelers team this year is I don't think a lot of people expected them to be where they are in the AFC North. I think a lot of people thought they were going to be struggling this year, including Steelers fans, and they've definitely stepped up within that very tough AFC North. They're in a playoff position right now. But if you talk to Steelers fans, there is a lot of frustration among Steelers fans with their offensive game planning and specifically with their offensive coordinator, Matt Canada. The Pittsburgh Steelers have now gone 56 straight games without 400 yards of offense, 56 games without Ooh. 400 yards of offense. 
the team that is second in the NFL for longest streak of games without 400 yards of offense is actually the Packers, but we're only at 15 straight games and we're only 13 yards away on Sunday against the Rams. <laughs> One other important streak as far as futility of offense is concerned, because that is, I think, the theme of both teams. The Packers have now gone six straight games without scoring more than 20 points. That is the Packers' longest streak since 1992. We have two offenses that are certainly struggling for their identity. I think, again, Pittsburgh fans are very frustrated because they very much do not like their offensive coordinator. They think that he has a mindset that may be decades old as far as his approach to the game, and that's going to give our defense opportunities. On the other hand, the Pittsburgh defense certainly can make big plays on their own. Right. You've got you've got a young quarterback in in Kenny Pickett. You've got a young receiver in George Pickens. And I think the Steelers fans want more out of that offense. Their identity, I feel, though, right now is on the defense. A guy that Green Bay fans really want, T.J. Watt. He is going to be difficult to stop on Sunday. Yeah, figuring out how to scheme against T.J. Watt or how to stop Pittsburgh schemes that with T.J. Watt is certainly going to be a big part of our game plan. Now, the teams, from a numerical standpoint, are, again, relatively evenly matched, despite the great, much better record for the Pittsburgh Steelers. For offensive yards, the Steelers are actually 29th in the NFL in offensive yards per game versus 24 of the Packers. Passing, they're both low 20s, running both low 20s. Points per game, low 20s as far as their offenses are concerned. So both offenses, just based on those streaks that they have, are struggling. What I was a little bit surprised at was looking at the numbers for the Packers versus the Steelers defense. So by DVOA, the Steelers defense is ranked somewhat higher. They're seventh versus 22 in defensive DVOA. DVOA, of course, takes into account the, the plays that are involved. But as far as yards are concerned, we're actually way ahead of them. The Packers are 11th in yards per game on defense. Steelers are actually 31st in yards per game on defense, allowing 377 yards wow. per game and equally weak against the pass 25th and the run 29th. So although they are making big plays at times, and the DVOA has got to represent all of the turnovers that they are able to cause, they're allowing a lot of yards. And so we will have our opportunities. We avoid the turnover. We've got the opportunity for a decent enough day on offense that if our defense makes the plays, we're going to be in a position to win. Well, and maybe this is a chance again, we had the run game really going against the Rams. So maybe if they can keep that going, you know, feeding uh, Aaron Jones, give it to Dylan occasionally. And oh, by the way, Let's get Luke Musgrave and, and maybe even Tucker Kraft. Let's throw him in there as well. Oh, you know, it's a tight end party. Let's just, let's do that. Um, but <laughs> Jeff, yeah, Jeff, I don't need to know your fantasy life. Okay. <laughs> and, and so Neil, again, you're going to be in Pittsburgh looking forward to a great game there, but there is a game that Jeff, you and I went to yep. and it's depicted here and you have a little bit of history about the Packers and the Steelers and, and really a big moment in Packer history. Absolutely. So I call this Yancey Thigpen's Christmas gift to Green Bay. So as we've talked about, there's been a number of memorable games against Green Bay and the Pittsburgh Steelers, maybe Super Bowl 45, you know, sure. bring a bell. But perhaps none were as important or memorable in these uh, in this history as the game that the Steelers and the Packers played on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1995, at Lambeau Field. Again, the picture here, for starters, John, I was at the game with you, yeah. and we had a couple friends with us as well. We had a quintessential December Lambeau Field. It was a gray, kind of damp, overcast day. It was periods of snow flurries. So we, we've got everything, everything's ready for the game. The Packers were a team on the rise. So they had made the, the playoffs the previous two seasons, and they were coming into the game with a really good 10-5 and five record. The Steelers were the AFC Central Division champs by far at this point, and they were coming into the game at 11-4. and four. So the game was, was hard fought. The Packers did really well. They were led most of the game. So I don't know if you remember this. So Favre took a huge hit in the third quarter. He called a timeout. He goes over to the sidelines, spits up a mouthful of blood on the sideline because he said he didn't want to, like, spit in the middle of the field and have a bunch of blood in the middle of the field. He kept playing. 
So he passed for 301 yards and two touchdowns. So Green Bay is leading going into in the fourth quarter, 24 to 19. Pittsburgh gets the ball on their own 20. They drive 79 yards in 19 plays. Talk about a methodical drive. 16 seconds left in the game. Fourth down from the Packer one. Okay. Quarterback Neil O'Donnell, remember that guy, he drops back to pass. His receiver, Yancey Thigpen, he runs a slant and go, getting free of Packer defender, a guy by the name of Lenny Gill. He had slipped down. No Packer defenders within five yards. O'Donnell throws the ball. Thigpen gets hit between the eight and the two of his uniform. The play occurred in the north end zone. And, John, we were sitting actually in the south end zone. Southwest, yeah. Yeah, so we didn't get a good look at this. It looked like a sure touchdown catch, right? All of a sudden, there's this roar that comes from the north end zone (laughs) and just kind of works its way through Lambeau Field. Big Pen dropped the ball. (laughs) So what does this mean? His drop gave the Packers the victory because there was 10 seconds or 11 seconds left and their first outright Central Division championship since 1972. It was also the first of three consecutive NFC Central Division championships, 95, 96, 97. So in closing, let's hope that a victory over Pittsburgh this Sunday is a springboard to success for Jordan Love and this Packers team. All right, so we're looking forward to the game on Sunday. Neil, you're going to be there. Any final thoughts? That Yancey Thigpen game was a central game as far as all of us was concerned. We were all in our mid-20s at that point. We had never seen the Packers in our conscious lives win a division title. This was a sign that this Packers team was different. It was different than these one-year wonders we had like in 89 or in 82 or in 78. This was a team that had legs. This was a team that had a future. I think our current team has a future. I'm looking forward to its continued development. This game is an opportunity. I don't feel completely confident in this as a victory, but it is an opportunity. If we win in Pittsburgh, that is a springboard for the rest of the season. So before we close tonight, I just want to give a shout out to the two guys from Orange County, California at Brick House Burgers and Brews in West De Pere after the game. So these two guys had never been to the state of Wisconsin. They had never been to Green Bay. They had never been to a Packer game. So you know what? They were in in Chicago, in the, in the Chicago area for business. They decide they're going to go all in. They drive up to the game Sunday morning. They, they get second row tickets to the game. They were blown away. They were <laughs> so just amazed at like the hospitality. They didn't even really tailgate because they didn't get there to the game till 1130 little bit before the game they go in they're like the flyover just the game the fans they were completely blown away i didn't get their names so but i know one guy that we're sitting next to he's following us which All is right. fabulous i mean so you know if you're listening again i enjoy talking with you at the bar just random encounter at brick house love talking with you your raiders fans so you, you're, you're true fans, you know, I know what that means. That's great. I'm so happy that I got a chance to talk with you. I'm so glad that you enjoyed your stay in Green Bay, your cheese curds at the bar, your founder's breakfast stout. I'm glad you like that too. And you know what? I, I hope you, you know, you and your buddy, big dude wearing a big cheese head. <laughs> it was, it was awesome. Your shirt. The fuck around and find out shirt. Nice. Loved it. And again, I hope you made it back safely and you have nothing but fantastic stories uh, about Green Bay and Lambeau Field and and your Packers for a day, your Packer fans for a day. I'm I'm really (laughs) glad I got a chance to chat with you. And again, I hope you're listening. And and thanks to the, the folks at the tailgate party who did tell us, yeah, we listened to the podcast. They were happy to meet both of you as well. 
and and say, hey, I watch your podcast. Now I've met you in person. So that was great. Again, I appreciated both of you being there for the tailgate party, and, and I look forward to us doing it again. All right, if you're watching us on YouTube, then please hit that subscribe button. It's free. Leave us a comment. Find the GBC podcast at Green Bay Chat. That's all one word. We're on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, and Spotify, as well as on Facebook at the GBC podcast, Green Bay Chat. And may you fully appreciate the magnitude of your impending good fortune. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Go Pack.